Okay, so here's the two uh, starting materials. Here's one of our starting materials, and here's the other starting material. So let's copy this into your notes. And before we write anything, let's just talk together about what we think is going to happen here. Um, first of all, let's identify the alpha carbon. Where's the alpha carbon? The one next to the I, yeah. Remember, the alpha carbon is the one with the leaving group. Is this a good leaving group? Yes. Yeah, neutral halogens are a good leaving group. That's on page two of the handout. All right. Um, it's probably a good idea to number the carbons as well. One, two, three. This is not nomenclature numbering. This is just reference numbering. I mean, where can I put the numbers here? Maybe one, two, and three. I don't know. I don't want to get them confused, but those like are our numbers. Okay. Okay, so <laughs> those are our numbers. All right, now what type of mechanism is going to happen here? Um, Let's try to use the table on page three. So which row are we in on the table on page three? Primary, secondary, or tertiary? Primary. Primary. We're in the primary row. Um, and um, Primary, unhindered. And bulky. I mean, unhindered. So we're dirty, too. It's not and bulky. Our, yeah, no. This is oh, a very oh, bulky oh, base. Yeah, Notice that there's oh, three yeah. methyls. This is actually that tert butyl oxide. Oh. Actually, I didn't write this right. Sorry. I left out a carbon. All right. There. So oh, yeah. now this is turbine oxide. <laughs> so now you can say turbine. It's one of the most bulky so we know yeah. it's E2. All right. So we can see this is almost always E2. Okay. All right. Now E2 is actually maybe the most complicated reaction you guys are going to see this semester. E2 is actually quite complicated. Um, one thing that we should decide here is, is this going to be one step or two steps? One. Yeah, because how many steps is SN2? One. Yeah, so this is kind of like SN2 in the sense that there's only one step. Okay. All right. But a lot of things happen in that one step. One thing that's going to be helpful here is we have to label not just the alpha carbon, but the beta carbon. Who do you think is the beta carbon here? Number two. Number two. <laughs> the beta carbon, so we know the alpha carbon is the one that's attached to the leaving group. Well, then obviously the beta carbon must be attached to the alpha carbon. Uh, if, we, if we went further, we could call this the gamma carbon, but we don't care about that. We just need the alpha and the beta carbons. Okay, and both of them are going to participate in this reaction. Okay, so what's going to be happening here? Um, well, who, who here really wants to be at the tail of an arrow? Who really wants the to be oxygen. at the tail? Yeah, this has a negative charge. It really wants to be at the tail of an arrow. But who is it going to donate its electrons to? Well, the alpha carbon. Let's think about that. Is this going to act here like a nucleophile or like a base? A base. Yeah. SN2 has a nucleophile, but E2 has a base. That's the big difference between SN2 and E2. Remember, SN2 stands for nucleophilic substitution. So for SN2, you use a nucleophile, but for E2, we use a base. So we know that our tert butyl oxide is going to be acting like a base here. What, what do E2 bases do? For? What does the Bronsted, I'm sorry? What does E2 stand for? Uh, what does the E stand for? Yeah. Does anyone know what the E stands for? Elimination. Elimination, Elimination. that's right. Yeah. By the way, an elimination reaction is a reaction that um, forms a new pi bond. An elimination reaction is a reaction that forms a new pi bond. The, the name is kind of misleading because we're not eliminating a pi bond, we're actually forming a new pi bond. An elimination reaction forms a new pi bond. Okay. That actually, that's a good question, that's important to know. And, and the two it. is bimolecular? Again. Because both of these molecules will be participating in the single in step. The single step. Okay. That's right. There is only one step, so there's only one, so that one step is the rate determining step and both of these molecules will participate, and we're trying to figure out how they will participate. So let's keep going through that step by step. All right, so SN2 involves a nucleophile, E2 involves a base. Uh, what do nucleophiles do? Nucleophiles join substrates. Nucleophiles join substrates. That's what a nucleophile does. It attaches to the substrate molecule. Okay. What do bases do? Do you guys remember, what's the bronsted lowery definition of a base? What does a base do? One that can give that would be the Lewis uh, base definition. It turns out that bronsted lowery is going to be more helpful to us here. Does a base take a proton or lose a proton? Lose. Oh, takes a take proton. Take a proton. Yeah, bases take protons. So now we know the difference between a nucleophile and a base. Wait, can you say what nucleophile is here? A nucleophile is something that joins the substrate. Okay. 
Isn't that what we've seen the nucleophiles doing in our SN2 and in our SN1 reactions? We've seen the nucleophile joining the alpha carbon, joining the substrate. Remember, the substrate is just the compound that the nucleophile is attacking. Um, so nucleophiles join something. Um, oh, I, I should be more specific. They join something by donating electrons, I should say. A nucleophile is something that joins the substrate by donating electrons. So nucleophiles are at the tail of the arrow. That's what we've seen the nucleophiles doing in our SN1 and SN2 reactions. What does a base do? It steals a proton. Okay, Bases so are proton stealers. Okay, so in this case, um, how does it take the H though? Yeah, so let's go through that. So this guy's gonna be at the tail. Now we have to figure out who goes at the head. Well, now we know who goes at the head, one of the protons. But it's not the proton on the alpha carbon. Ooh. It's the proton on the beta carbon. The base steals the beta hydrogen. Base okay. And beta. That's what you can remember. Okay. So let's show what that would look like here. I'll have to draw in this bond now. I'll draw in the lone pair that the oxygen is donating. This oxygen is going to be donating its lone pair to this hydrogen. That's the way it's going to steal the hydrogen. So, so far we have that arrow. Okay, now this should make you worry. So, so we're taking these electrons out of this bond. Where are the electrons going to go to? Make a new bond? Yeah, a new bond. A bond between who and who? Between the oxygen and the hydrogen. But then that leaves these Is it going to still be connected? The hydrogen to here, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, it can't be, right? Because a hydrogen cannot be bonded to two things. So, you're right to be worried. We should be worried about what's going to happen to these electrons over here. These can't be just stranded in a bond, so I need a new arrow. I'm going to put these electrons at the tail, but where are these electrons going to go to? Well, remember, an elimination reaction does what? They can create the a new pi bond. Oh, okay. This is how we show the creation bond. of a pi bond. It's going to make a double bond? That's right. Oh, that's cool. Could you have put it in <laughs> between the beta carbon and the gamma carbon? That's a good question. Uh, remind me to come back to that in a second. Okay. All right. So in this case, we're going to put that over here. All right, so. Ooh, and now carbon has too many bonds. Now so the alpha carbon is. Oh my god. Yeah, so. <laughs> so the I is going to leave. Because, as we said at the beginning, it's a good leaving group. And what does it do? Remember, a leaving group leaves and takes its electrons with it. And that's going to make the room. And that answers your question. We could not make the new pi bond over here because this doesn't have any leaving groups. Right. Right. This doesn't have leaving groups, so there's no room for a new pi bond on this carbon. So it's got to go like this. All right, so you start to see why I said this is really a very complicated reaction. There's three different arrows in the one reaction. Three different arrows, and we have to like, think about not just the alpha carbon, but now the beta carbon as well. Now, do we, are we going to want to deprotonate that carbon? Well, let's see. First of all, let's draw the product from this, and then we'll see whether we need to do any deprotonation. Now, take your time. Remember that we've discussed, if you really understand electron pushing arrows, it should now be easy to draw the correct products. So take your time, and let's draw what the products would look like based on these electron pushing arrows. I like this one. This like E2 business. I'll be better off with pencil. Okay, so we know that this arrow indicates that this oxygen is taking this lone pair, and what's it doing with the lone pair? It's forming a bond with this hydrogen. I recommend that whenever you're forming a new bond, you actually draw that bond, and for, for a beginner, it's good to actually draw the pair of electrons in the bond. So, this pair of electrons went from being a pair on the oxygen to being in this bond with the hydrogen. And now, let's take care of the charge, because this is the guy at the initial tail. The guy at the initial tail changes charge. Neutral. Yeah, it started negative and it's losing electrons, so it becomes neutral. It looks to me like you guys got that right. Now let's see what's happening to our substrate. Pi bond 
bond between alpha and beta. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, let's see here, step by step. This hydrogen is gone now from the beta carbon, right? And what happened to this pair of electrons? It went here. I'm going to draw that pair of electrons in the new pi bond. So we can see that there. Um, and then the number one carbon lost the bond to the hydrogen um, over here. So that also gives us this. And now whose charge do we have to change? Because this is at the final head. We only changed two charges at the initial tail and the final head. The iodide started neutral, and it's gaining electrons, so it ends up negative. I think some, uh, one of you put a positive charge on this alpha carbon, yeah. but actually would be a mistake uh, in right. this case. So remember, we always change exactly two charges. We change the charge at the initial tail, and we change the charge at the final head. You don't change any charges in the middle, because everybody in the middle is both gaining and losing electrons. Take a look at this alpha carbon for a second. Notice how this alpha carbon is gaining electrons from the pi bond and losing electrons from this arrow. Um, so do you guys all see what I mean by the initial tail and the final head? 